All right, so welcome everyone to lecture four for industrialized construction. I assume you can see and hear everything, but if not, let me know. Um, and today we're going to be talking about a framework for industrialized construction. So that's our goal for today's class. Um, we'll follow that. Uh, uh, this is an overview of what we mean when we say industrialized construction in a holistic sense. Um, we'll follow that up by uh, a very exciting um, guest lecture from Alex Mirasan, who has a startup based out of Lausanne um, called Aeternum uh, Technologies. And uh, that'll be for hour two. And then in hour three, we will have our uh, big reveal of the project teams for the course. And we're going to give you some time to get to know your teams and start working together. So that's our objective for today. We'll start first with our framework for industrialized construction. And uh, let's just jump right into it. So um, why do we need a framework for industrialized construction? We've so far talked about what is industrialized construction. We've talked about construction as a manufacturing process. Um, so why do we now need some kind of framework to help guide ourselves? Um, and a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, the concept is complex and very interrelated. I like to say in this class, um, we don't offer anything particularly new. Everything that we talk about is, is not um, in and of itself uh, 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 completely new. But what's new is the way that everything ties together to have a different kind of strategy or orientation um, to create industrialized building systems as a holistic concept. So therefore we need to think very carefully about all these different parts and components coming together. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about with the framework. And I'll, I'll say again that prefabrication um, and the building systems are a strategy for production, but these things alone do not make an industrialization strategy. So. Um, I, I say it a lot, but I'll say it again, is that prefabrication is not the same thing as industrialized construction. So we, 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 we have prefabrication on the, this wheel, so it is a, a component, but uh, the overall um, approach is much more holistic than just prefabrication. Um, so then we need this holistic view. So let's just jump into it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through each of these eight areas um, and, and have two or three slides for each area where I'm going to describe at a higher level what this area means. Um, and then uh, the ninth area is this kind of continuous improvements bubble that wraps around everything. So here, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll discuss what we mean by the continuous improvements. And remember, in your course projects, you're going to actually have to describe for each of these eight areas um, how your your idea um, meets uh, or, or responds to the, the description of these eight areas. So pay close attention because you'll need it for your course project. In fact, you'll get 20 points to spend across the eight areas. And I'll say a little bit more about that at the end, but um, this will be very key for your course project. Let's start here with this first one here, which is planning and control of the processes. Um, and what do we mean by that? In other words, the design, the manufacturer assembly, the site work and all the processes have a defined structure um, that can be documented and communicated throughout the organization. Um, and so what, what we try to emphasize with industrialization is the repeatability of, and the, the knowledge um, exchange that can be repeated and standardized. So in this sense, the, the planning and the preparation of the activities involved have some thought into them and we don't solve um, uh, each, each project on a single case, but we create a, a sense of, of process throughout the entire um, approach. And so we wanna, we wanna define the roles of the projects and processes in a, in a meaningful way. Here's an example. Um, some, a lot of these examples in this lecture come from Sweden because they were some of the early innovators in industrialized uh, construction. So I, I, I've borrowed several examples from Sweden. Um, but here we see, here's the, the idea of the design and preparations. Here's some Swedish words, which I don't know, but you know, I, we, you can kind of see these. Um, and so you have design and preparations that are closely integrated with production. Um, and then you have the manufacturing stage, which depends on the information from the design. And here you have the assembly and site to keep up with manufacturing. And so these are all interrelated processes that need to be 
plan together in a meaningful way. And the real point here is about establishing stability and predictability so that um, each time you have a, a, a new project, you follow these standard processes until the project is completed. And you can see that here on this board um, or this process diagram where you can see some of the decisions that are being made by an industrial asset construction company. So that was a little bit hard to kind of wrap your mind around, but we'll talk more about processes in a future lecture. Um, here, the next area, the second area we'll talk about is the idea of developed technical systems. So what we mean by technical systems are really the technical um, building systems. Um, and depending on what you're trying to industrialize, uh, this could be different. So um, it could be that you're creating technical systems for the entire building, or it could be that you're just looking at a small um, part like a wall or something like this. But uh, uh, whatever you're developing a technical system for, um, you, this would fall under the developed technical systems or the building system. So it could be for the structural frame, the roof, the facade, uh, the foundations, the insulations. Um, these are all different things that, that you can develop building systems or technical systems around. It could be for the mechanical systems as well. Um, it could be for a piece of a bridge if it was a bridge project. Uh, you want to develop um, robust solutions and uh, the, the technical building system could include solutions for the whole building. So um, we do want to think not only about the individual pieces and components like the walls, but how do the, all the different pieces of the puzzle come together? So how does the floor interact with the wall, interact with the roof? And if you're going to prefabricate, you need to think about the interdependency of these parts. Um, now, this one is key that the systems and solutions are developed in a separated development processes. So um, you don't test out a new solution um, on a project basis. You actually think through and develop the building as a product, and then you try to develop these processes individually. And then you can also test these, these, um, these building systems individually. And then when it's ready, you kind of release a new version of the product system and you impl implement that on that many projects. Um, uh, this is the kind of versioning that we talk about. And here's an example of different pieces that could be uh, a part of a developed technical system. So you could have the roof, you could have the different uh, uh, wall panels, you could have floor panels, um, you could have interior panels like this. We, we, you don't see like the mechanical systems, but these would also count as technical systems. And so you have to decide, okay, how much of a developed technical system are we going to, to go with? Um, and then here you can see the kind of breakdown where you start to create the product, overall product architecture and the breakdown of the system. So this is what we mean by tech, developed technical systems. And you saw probably from your technology scouting many different examples of technical systems. So here you have a lot of the product uh, innovation, I think, that happens. <clears throat> Third, we move to the over here to the prefabrication of building parts. Um, so now we're talking about the means of fabrication. So this is no longer about the product design, but how is the product manufactured? And um, since we're rapidly approaching a time of robotics or in situ 3D printing fabrication, um, this, this category probably needs to expand and be updated to, to not just be about prefabrication, but it could also include on-site robotics of building parts. But essentially the, the principles still hold is that building parts should be manufactured in suitable facilities. And um, we should avoid kind of the on-site uh, work if it's if it's not um, if it's not a suitable facility if it's not a high pro uh, performing production facility, um, the belief is that factory production has good conditions for effective production and stable processes. Um, not to mention better safety. But um, we are seeing new ideas such as mobile factories or um, on on site robotics where we just want to make sure we have effective production and stable processes. That's the goal with the, the, the fabrication. Um, yeah, and then the idea behind factories or prefabrication is that the working conditions can be better than traditionally found on site. So you don't have to deal with weather. Um, you can have better logistics. You can have more specialized machinery. And you can also coordinate the relationship between other trades on the site. And there are very different prefabrication strategies. So part of your task in your company is to think about 
what is your prefabrication strategy going to be? Are you going to make in your own factory? So um, this would be kind of the vertical integration strategy that we're seeing as a trend where um, you, know, you, you design your own factory, you buy your equipment and your machinery, and then you build this in your own factory. Or are you gonna go with a buy strategy? So um, we see this emerging as this kind of orchestrator model where you're gonna buy different parts and components, but you're not gonna build, you're not gonna make anything yourself. So then you're a little bit uh, more capital light and not so heavy, um, but then you have a little bit less control of the process. Um, and finally, uh, we'll talk later about the level of prefabrication versus the amount of site work, right? So you could imagine that if you really prefabricate everything, you get towards the more of a volumetric or modular approach. So you have boxes and this reduces the amount of site work. But the negative side here is that you have less flexibility, right? So now you no longer are able to kind of create these more interesting designs or mass customization. You're, you're restricted to this um, volumetric. So then maybe you want a more um, panelized or kit of parts flat pack solution. These are different prefabrication strategies that you're going to have to decide about and which all industrialized construction companies are, that are dealing with factories are, are deciding about now. Right, so here's the different different approaches. So you can see here, this is in a, in a factory where they're doing all of the installations, right? So this is a kitchen. You can see they're, they're putting in all the pre-work. So everything is done in a, in a module and including the tiling and the finishes. So then this would be a very highly finished um, product. It would ship it and uh, use, uh, uh, you know, some kind of crane system put it into the final location and then you'd install the exteriors and you'd be done. You wouldn't have to do very much work on the interiors, possibly some work at the joints, but uh, this is a very highly uh, prefabricated approach. Um, there are other approaches such as a panelized approach here. So you create the panels and then you put the panels together as you need to. So this is a much more um, flexible approach, but now you have more work that needs to be completed on site. And there are trade-offs and benefits to these different approaches. And finally, talking about prefabrication, you have also the need for automation. So the uh, question is, how much automation do you want to do? I've seen some highly automated factories. Um, in fact, I just was uh, on a call a couple months ago where I saw an extremely automated factory and they're still not coming out of uh, stealth mode, I guess you could say. They're, they're, they're hiding um, their, their results so far, but uh, it was pretty impressive to see the level of automation. Um, but I've seen other companies where really it's not very automated, but it's a lot of people working underneath a roof in a very controlled situation. And, uh, and they, they therefore feel like it's still more effective and efficient. So um, one thing you'll have to decide and which all companies have to decide is how automated will the facility be? And decisions to automate are important ones because if you buy a very specialized tool with high levels of automation capabilities, you of course need to make sure that you're getting the value out of that, that uh, machine and that you're paying back the, the high upfront costs. So um, this is an important decision of, of how and when to automate. Um, so you need to have a maturity in your technology and processes. Um, we'll talk later about some of the dangers of just buying high, you know, highly capable equipment, but maybe not having maturity in your building system or your processes. Um, I think uh, Katera serves as a very interesting example there of spending a lot of money on great machines, but maybe not having the right technology or processes behind it. And we'll discuss that later in the class where we have a case study discussion about this company called Katera. Um, and then there's a need to balance the investments and the volume, right? So you want to make sure you have a steady volume and then figure out the right time to invest in automation. Um, and we will have a lecture later from Google where they will talk about different options and uh, a kind of state of the art for um, manufacturing machines. So we can understand the kind of landscape of state of the art prefabrication machines in a factory. Unfortunately, we probably won't get a chance to go tour Ernest factory where you could see it in person, but um, hopefully this will be at least the, the next best thing. <clears throat> All right, so we've gone through three categories. And I know this is quite fast, but my goal is to just give you an overview. And some of these we will be coming back to later in the class. 
So this next one is long-term relations between the actors. If you think about traditional construction, um, it's done on a project basis and it's involved with a tender or a low bid um, cost competition for who can design a, a specific single project the cheapest. If you look at the relationship between uh, in the auto, manu auto manufacturing or cars, you see a much different relationship where Toyota, for example, will have four or five, six year long relationships with suppliers that they renew continually. So they're always kind of keeping the same suppliers and continuity in the supply chain. Um, and this allows you to co-create and co-develop processes and building systems together with suppliers. So in industrialization, uh, we really look for this uh, long-term relations between supp uh, uh, suppliers. So this could be strategic partnering and it could happen between suppliers with subcontractors, excuse me, and also clients. So you could have a, a, a real estate company that you have a long-term relationship with and you promise to fulfill a certain amount of order. Um, this enables a common development of the, of the processes, the methods and the systems. So everyone uh, can create continuity and then improve on, on that. And of course, then common investments in, in IT tools. Um, and then the selection of partners is not necessarily on a low cost basis, although cost is important. The selection of partners can be based off of, um, you know, a, a good working relationship and a kind of mutual vision for reducing the overall cost of the system. And it avoids some of the short-term thinking of traditional construction where decisions are made on a project by project basis. Um, there is a little bit of theory behind this. It's called transaction cost theory. Um, we won't get too much into the economics of this, but the idea is that working together on a long-term basis means less transaction costs. Uh, you could call transaction costs the time it takes to work with somebody new. So today you're going to get put into your team and there's going to be some transaction costs where you get to know each other and you figure out how other people work and what their schedule's like, what their email is, you know, all of these little things add up where they, you could call it kind of wasted time of setting up the processes each time. So by creating a long-term partnerships, you eliminate these transaction costs. You don't have to set things up new each project, but you have a, a continuity. And these relations will of course grow and develop over time. And the idea is to over, overcome what we call in the construction industry as a, a learning disability. So we, we don't learn because we always are changing partners, but in this way, we want to kind of create a, a stable, continuous partnership. All right, so number four was long-term relationships between the actors. Number five is the idea of logistics integrated into the building process. So let me actually just go to the picture and then I'll come back to this text. Um, this is the idea that if you're going to prefabricate or invest in, in heavy machinery, you should think about the logistics all the way starting at the design. Um, it's important that you don't design a volumetric module that's bigger than can fit, for example, on a truck or on the crane that you wish to use. So you need to think about logistics all the way from the starting point and then integrate them into the entire building process. Um, a couple of specific examples. Um, you think about the flow of materials and the flow of information from design, planning, manufacturing, and site work. So you've, you've thought about how the logistics and the, and the flow of the project happens. Um, you coordinate transportation throughout the supply chain. So you've thought about how to, how to move these large modules if you're building, for example, something quite large. Um, and you should involve the material, the component, and the element suppliers in the development process. So we don't want to just kind of uh, make decisions unilaterally, but then you do it with your long-term partners in the supply chain. And then, of course, this enables you, by having this continuity, to have suitable equipment for material handling and use that throughout the supply chain. So um, this could be, uh, for example, the, the, the correct use of the right lifts or um, the right cranes, but you can then um, invest in the right equipment for, for construction. Um, here's an example from Japan. So here is a volumetric modular factory. And uh, I don't read Japanese, but uh, from what I understand and from what's been told to me here, you see the, the setup of the factory is in a U shape. Um, so on the, uh, the, if you think about the starting point of the module, it, there's some panels here and they start moving this way. And you see here, you have kind of the three-sided panel and then the modules come out this way all the way through 
and then the modules kind of uh, leave out this way. Um, or actually, it looks like they kind of they get boxed up and leave out. They leave out this way. So what happens is that they put the people here in the middle um, and and the smaller equipment here, and then from the outside you can supply the larger equipment in the factory. So on the outside you have access routes uh, for for the larger bulk materials, and then you have an inner U shape where people can can access and work from the inside stations. So that you've thought about the the factory design so that you can supply the materials, the workstations and minimize extra transportation or movements, right? So again, this is thinking about the logistics of the factory. And part of your task, if you do decide to have your own factory as part of the project will be to design the logistics of, of the factory at a very high level, conceptual level. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, uh, sixth, we have the idea of advanced ICT tools. Um, you know, if you're going to have advanced production, you're going to require more accurate and reliable information, and you need the most state of the art in uh, in information communication technologies or ICT. Um, you know, today we use a lot of things like a lot of words like digital fabrication and BIM, and this uh, is kind of agnostic to what type of tools you use, what kind of software you want to use, but uh, overall, this is the purpose of using such technologies. Um, so we want to, to develop these advanced building systems and use them to manage the design and manage the components and combinations. Um, and furthermore, we can then simulate and visualize these. We have an entire lecture where we'll talk about um, kind of uh, product configurators and how the, what the state of the art is. So um, this is a little bit on the kind of older side, uh, but this is kind of an example from maybe 15 years ago about how early industrialized construction companies would use 5D BIM, for example. So 5D BIM is kind of cost and schedule incorporated into the model. And uh, this is a tool called Vico, where you could visualize the production and also understand how the cost changes over time. Um, you can also start to think about uh, using PDM and PLM, so product data management and product lifecycle management, which is very common in manufacturing, but not so common in construction. So you can manage your products over the life cycle. Um, and so many companies are developing their own systems for tracking components and understanding where they are. We'll talk about fabrication uh, uh, aware or fabrication um, yeah, fabrication-aware design tools in a future lecture. So you can see the state of the art of these kind of design tools. Um, but regardless, you need to think about your IT strategy for, for industrialized construction. Um, next, we have the measurements and reuse of experience. So here, it's, a, it's, it's more about how do we capture lessons learned and return those into our knowledge base so that the product and processes will improve in the future. So you need a real systematic um, way to, to reuse experience um, and to measure performance, so strengths and weaknesses. Um, this is a bit more, I think, on the humanistic side, but it also now with more advanced tools, you can start to use uh, AI or you can start to use more um, structured ways of collecting data. So um, it, it's about follow-ups throughout the process and taking care of the information um, and creating a stability in the process and the technology. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, again, these are very early examples or old school examples, I would say, of um, in the factory, are there uh, frequency uh, and uh, account of the deviation? So how many times did we, did we depart from the expected plan? And we write that down. Um, here, there's a, a tool called the plan percent complete. So how many units did we plan to complete? and how many units did we complete in the end in the factory? And you can measure this and track your performance and start to look for root causes of these deviations. So this is the idea that you wanna really reuse your experiments, measure and reuse your, your, your experience. All right, and eighth is the idea of a customer and market focus. We will also have an upcoming lecture just about this topic, um, but it's the idea that you if you're gonna invest in high capital costs like robots or um, high uh, precision manufacturing systems, you better build what the customer wants and not uh, the, the wrong thing. 
Um, and this is an example from Bocluc, who will have a guest lecture from next week, um, and how they've designed their whole system with the idea of uh, a customer in mind. In fact, their customer specifically is, a, I think I've mentioned this before, but is a, a single working mother who's a, who has a job as a nurse and uh, wants to buy a, an affordable home. So um, what can she afford? And that's the price point that they set their product to. And they design around this idea. Uh, but it's not just about cost. It can also be about creating design lines um, and specific uh, 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 finishes and um, selection of finishes that match a certain aesthetic that a customer might want. So you understand what your customer um, might desire. So you actually think about a target customer. You think about the needs, the priorities, the trends, and the price levels that that customer can meet. Um, you can work towards customer and market segmentation. So actually creating different products to meet the needs of different customers, um, and then develop your strategy for each of these different segments. Um, and then your production system is, is organized around certain, certain products for these certain customers. Um, and then, sorry, finally, uh, what's the market knowledge? So uh, what are the overall needs? Where are cities growing? What's the international market look like? This is kind of thinking about the overall market and how the product might, might grow. <clears throat> okay, so that's a very high level view of these eight areas. And they, I, they're wrapped all together. This wheel is wrapped in this kind of uh, uh, continuous improvement cycle. So the idea is that you have these eight sub areas that need to be continuously improved. Um, and it's not about just setting them up once, but it's about always improving them and, and making them better. Um, so this is possible when the processes, systems, teams, tools are used on a long-term basis. Um, I keep emphasizing this point, but it's very different than traditional construction where projects are one of a kind and the teams develop unique solutions, processes, and teams for each project. But instead, we really want to look at this continuous improvement for um, construction. And the idea here is, is one of, a, of kind of a ball rolling up a hill. If you think about creating a standard and you think about a, a knowledge, you want to continue to increase your knowledge of the product, um, you keep moving this ball up the hill. And then at a certain point, you put in this standard so it doesn't roll back any farther, right? So it's this process of going farther up the hill and then establishing a new standard and then moving farther up the hill. And this is a, a lean term PDCA for plan, do, check, act. But um, this is just the basic idea of continuously improving. Um, the idea is that uh, there's a famous quote is, is uh, you know, you can't approve what you can't measure or what gets measured um, gets done. Uh, it's from, from Deming, I believe. And the idea is that the stable processes can be improved. If you, if you create a process, then um, you can improve them, and these improvements set the new standards, so things keep improving. But if you don't ever standardize or create a, a target or, or some kind of uh, stable process, it's very difficult then to improve, and you're kind of just left with an ad hoc solution each time. And the information and knowledge must be shared in the, in the organization. So um, these standards are the way to do that. And you make sure that it's documented so that it doesn't reside in the minds of your smartest people. Because then when those people retire or they get better jobs or leave, um, you lose all of that knowledge. But instead, you invest in the standards so that when someone new comes, they can pick up uh, and improve from that state, from that point. Um, here's an example of how you can communicate the standards and the performance, right? So you establish certain standards and you use a, a way of visually measuring the standards in the factory, right? So we're, you know, we're, we're green, we're meeting the standard, yellow, we're, we're kind of not meeting the standard, red, we're, we're definitely not meeting it. Um, and visual boards and low tech are a way of promoting these kind of um, performance tracking in a way that everyone can see and understand how things are improving. So you create this culture of continuous improvement. All right, so to summarize um, the, the wheel or the framework for industrialized construction, it really is about this high degree of continuity and it requires um, continuity between technologies and systems, between the teams and the relationships and the supply chain and the processes and the methods. And that's really where it's a holistic way of thinking about construction. 
Uh, again, I, I like to say there's nothing particularly new here, but it's about the, the integration and the synergy between these different areas where we can really see something interesting be created. Um, and really focus on the process, the whole process, and not just the specific building projects. And we should not forget about continuous improvements because that's how we, we make things better. So in addition to just this overall framework, there's also um, eight uh, ways to measure the eight sub areas. Um, and you, I'll give an example in a moment, but this is where you're gonna have 20 points to spend across the eight sub areas, right? So you have to decide in your startup, are we gonna go for level zero where we're not gonna do anything in this area? Or are we going to go for level four, where this is like really we put a lot of emphasis and effort on this area? And uh, you only get 20 points to spend because I want to see how you make different prior priorities and prioritizations of the different areas, right? Do you want to focus on prefabrication or do you want to focus on um, the customer and market focus, right? So it's very easy. You could say, well, we want to be four and everything, but by only having 20 points, you have to make your focus on what you'll start with as your most important things. So level zero means that there's no effort made in the area. It's just not something that the company considers. A level one means you've kind of identified the area, but you're not really focusing on it. A level two means you've partly implemented it and there's some efforts, but it's not really a major focus. Level three is you have a clear strategy, so it's really implemented. And level four is it's a, it's a strength and you've implemented it fully and you've integrated it also with the other areas of industrialized construction. So that's a level four. And here's just an example of how you would measure these areas. So um, for the offsite manufacturing of building parts here, if you have zero, it would mean you don't do any offsite production um, or you don't do any kind of digital fabrication, robotic production. It's all kind of traditional craft work, right? Um, a one would be uh, simple parts of the building are manufactured off-site, so like roof trusses and concrete elements. A two means that more advanced parts are pre-assembled off-site. So this could be the, fa the facade elements, the wall and slab elements, and the stairs with ready surfaces. Um, a three would be advanced parts are pre-assembled and integrated with the other assembled parts. So now you start to get to uh, modules or um, or quite integrated panel solutions or or kind of integration of MEP with uh, mechanical and house technic with structural systems, um, and uh, so it could be volume elements or bathroom modules or pre pre assembled service elements, right? And four would be not only are you doing all of that, but you've also truly integrated this offsite with uh, design and manufacturing systems, your IT tools, the logistics principles, and the planning system. So it's just an example of how you would measure these different areas and make your decisions. Um, so here's the kind of, in the end, you get this radar chart and you can visualize, okay, here's how we fit along these different areas. Here's where we're strong, here's where we're weak. Um, and this will be something you'll need to do for your final report. All right, with the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to give a, a short industry example of how this framework was used in real life with a company to help them improve on their building systems. And this is a Swedish company called Scheinheim, if I say it right. I don't know if I get it exactly right. So those that speak Swedish, you can correct me later. Um, so uh, this is an older example, but I think it's a good, a good example of, of maybe how you think about the improvement of, of industrialized construction systems. So this was a company um, started in 2003 by some entrepreneurs. It was located in uh, Southern Sweden. I'm not gonna try to say the name of that city. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not even gonna try. Um, and they started as a developer and then they started building houses that they designed and controlled by themselves. But then after three years, they, they acquired a key supplier, and so they became a vertically integrated solution. So they expanded rapidly and started offices in eight cities across Sweden, and then they have built 1,500 houses since they started. And this, this information is quite, it's probably three or four years old since I set this up, so um, they've probably built many more since then. Um, they wanted to design you know, well-designed homes for affordable prices. They, they call it the focus on the normal income segment. So not, not the kind of low market or not the highest end of the market, but just kind of the, the normal income segment. Um, and they focused in a specific geographical market of Southern Sweden. Uh, and 
yeah, they saw that there was a great need and uh, there were no, not a lot of competition there. So that was the reason to go there. Um, they, they developed uh, their idea as a developer with a product platform and they wanted to control the whole process. So they really emphasized this kind of, uh, we say uh, in English, one-stop shop or, or kind of whole, whole development cycle from start to finish. So they wanted to acquire the land, they wanted to deal with the customers, they wanted to deal with the whole pro building process and finally hand the building over to the customer in the end. Um, so the customer relations and sales were handled by their own staff. They set target costs, uh, they had project managers and they went through the whole system. So and this is back in 2016, I got to visit them um, and see their production facilities. Um, that was interesting. Um, this is actually from a tour of Bokluk. So I think this, I got to drop this picture in an accident, but that's not actually from their factory. Um, so the idea was that they have a simple factory where they produce these panelized wall elements, high level of prefabrication, um, and the floor elements are built on sites. They wanted to have more optimized workstations. So you could argue how optimized these workstations are. Um, but they did focus on the working conditions to be better than building on the construction site. And here's an example of the finished wall element with pre-painted wood panel and windows, right? So um, here's the final product being built. And so we'll talk more, more later about product platforms, but the, this was the idea that they had their, their product platform and they developed as different lines of products from the, from the product platform. And here you can see it's a, a nice finished house. And here's uh, some of the final uh, uh, buildings made out of timber, made out of wood structures um, with their finished wall elements, beams for the floors and roof trusses. So some of these pictures are from their, their installation. The site work would be performed um, by the contractors with the elements provided by, by the company. Um, I'm just showing a couple pictures. They had varying levels of prefabrication that affected the production flow. There's some of the problems they had, but here you can see, um, you know, they did not assemble the, the finishes, but they would pack them inside and, and bring them and ship them and then install the pre-cut uh, finishes for the installations, the kitchens and things like that on site. And then it would turn into this, you know, without having to do on-site um, uh, modifications. Okay, so that was just a very brief overview of the company. What happened was that they had grown uh, rapidly and they needed to streamline their processes. So they started a, a new development program in 2009. And the goal there was to, um, to improve. They felt like the company needed to improve. So they wanted to establish more stable processes, improve the production processes and increase their continuous improvements. Um, so using the framework first, uh, uh, researchers worked with them to look at the present state, which you can see in blue, and they assessed all of the different eight areas. So they did interviews with the key personnel, and then they decided upon an improvement strategy. So which are the areas and how would they like to improve, right? So now you could think about strategically, how will we improve the overall company? And they, they landed on, on eight improvement areas. I won't be able to talk about all of the areas, but um, uh, these were the, the, eight, the six areas that they focused on. I will just have time to talk about a couple. So they wanted to increase, one of the decisions from using the framework was to increase the level of prefabrication. Um, so they, they decided to, um, increase the, to increase the manufacturing of their own facility and decrease their dependence on the outside contractors. So they wanted to, to have less um, dependence on, on um, suppliers and contractors and more of their own people um, controlling the process and uh, that helped them to move faster into new market regions. So one thing they decided to do was manufacture the floor elements in their own factory. Um, they then um, had their uh, entry roofs manufactured by a supplier before they were built more on kind of a bespoke basis. They all, uh, entered into an agreement to have a bathroom pods manufactured by suppliers uh, before they were, they were um, still building these uh, in kind of a panelized way, but they went to a pod solution and uh, they pre-assembled the roof trusses and panels. Um, so the result was that they were able to close the building in one working day. So, uh, you know, from arriving on site, they could get the roof on, which you can imagine in Sweden, it'd be nice if there's weather concerns. 
um, faster at the complementary work, so the other work, and decreasing the complexity on the site. So they increase their control and outputs. It's just a couple of examples of these roof trusses and panels. Uh, I think that's a floor panel, if I remember correctly. Um, next is they wanted to, to improve the way that assembly occurred. So they started to think about houses as products and they wanted to standardize the assembly process. So they had a new type of information carrier. Instead of going to these 2D plans, which it takes a certain amount of specialty in reading plans and, and uh, on-site experience, they took it inspiration from the idea of Lego. So they wanted to create a assembly guideline where you saw step-by-step step each step of the process and uh, think about how they could use that as inspiration. They also got inspiration from Ikea. So how do you go in a detailed kind of assembly guideline that anyone can follow? And so instead of giving the builders the detailed plans that you normally see on a construction site, they created this kind of step-by-step -step process. So they would know how to put the different pieces and kits together um, so the workers could read and, and follow. And you could see this is a very different view with three-dimensional details than a kind of typical plan, which has a lot of dimensions, has a lot of um, very specific information that can be hard to read if you're not uh, skilled at reading plans. Here's a couple more examples. And then they do have some things like technical details, but they're kind of also saying like, watch out for these problems here, they, these could occur. All right, and very quickly, the last point is about the information modeling. This was back in 2009. So um, uh, it's it seems old now, but at the time it was more state of the art in terms of BIM. Um, so they, they implemented BIM for all of their, their house models. Um, one model, but with different views. So they wanted to, to have a linked model, but have different customer view. Uh, uh, so the customer sees this, but it's linked to the engineering view, linked to the manufacturing view, and linked to the assembly view, right? So the idea is that um, certain, certain stakeholders need different information. So we want to give them a view representation that matches the, the level of information that they need. Um, so the customer view was all about visualization or photorealistic pictures so that they would feel like they could step into the house. The engineering view was about the structural frame or the energy and acoustic simulations. The manufacturing view was, was so they could derive the drawings for the manufacturing. So if, you know, using a CAD cam or, or a different system. And the assembly view was really this Lego view, right? So how do we create the drawings and guidelines so it can be assembled more uh, effectively? And uh, yeah, so then here is um, how they could simulate the, the customer experience. Again, it's quite, it's quite a long time ago, but then the customer can go in and click and pick different colors and, and different uh, schemes for, for customizing their, their finishes. And then you could generate um, in their time AutoCAD drawings from the model. Now we're much more advanced in this, but this was just an example of what they're able to do. So the customer could view either, you know, uh, here's here's what it looks like in, in you know, black, and now I want to see what it looks like in, in white so you can see the, the updated model, right? Um, and so it's all about customer acquisition with this, with this idea. This is the idea we've talked about with mass customization and customer acquisition.